distinguished guests, invitees, and speakers for the plenary session, all the participants, academicians, delegates, welcome to this uh, plenary session on holistic and uh, multidisciplinary education. And we have with us this afternoon, this uh, session is for about uh, one hour and 30 minutes. And we have uh, three eminent speakers. We have uh, Professor K. Ramachandran, is the advisor and professor, National Institute for Educational Planning and Administration, New Delhi. And I'm very happy to introduce such an eminent, experienced man of vision who has contributed for the development of education and uh, is advisor to several national international educational bodies and uh, he is an advisor to india africa institute of educational planning and administration and the national institute of educational planning and administration and he has served at unsf as a chief educational specialist and he's also worked for several decades at the national council of educational research and training. He has contributed in preparing many reports uh, on the state of education in India, including India, education for all towards quality with equity, and teachers in India, education system, how we manage teachers' workforce in India. And he has tremendously contributed towards the drafting of National Education Policy 2020, and is now supporting the central government as well as government of Karnataka in the implementation of national education policy. On behalf of Center for Educational and Social Studies, and on behalf of Ramaya Institute of Management, and on behalf of all the delegates and participants, I extend a very warm welcome to Professor Ramchandran, sir. May I request Professor Narendra, sir, to kindly welcome Ramchandran, sir. And I request him to chair this plenary session. Thank you, sir. And we have this afternoon, Dr. W.G. Prasanna Kumar is the chairman of Mahatma Gandhi National Council of Rural Education. Warm welcome to you, sir, for this plenary session. His expertise in disaster management has made him in the advisory panels of several state and national level departments. He is also an expert advisor for the government of Telangana in its disaster response force endeavor. A master trainer for civil services aspirants he conducts intensive training program periodically and uh, for an adoptive disaster risk resilient and eco-responsible India. His contributions towards curriculum development with rural-centric approach has been well received by higher education institutions across India. Welcome to you, sir, for this plenary session. May I request Professor Bhagya, madam, to kindly welcome Professor Prasanna Kumar, sir. Thank you for accepting our invitation, sir. Welcome to you, sir. We have another eminent speaker today, and uh, it is Professor Yugang Goyal. He is an associate professor of public policy at Flame University, Pune, and is the founder of Center for Knowledge Alternatives at the university, which maps local data and cultural cultures across India. Formerly, he was, an, uh, he was with O.P. Zindal Global University, is one of its founding faculty members steering a range of institution building efforts, in particular its research infrastructure and international collaborations. He pursued his master's and PhD in law and economics, and uh, he has published his research articles in reputed international journals and also contributes to national dailies and other popular fora. His research interests include the regulation, law and development, and is a visiting faculty to several institutes of repute, including Indian stuff, Management Ahmedabad and Indian Stuff Management Kojikud. And uh, very warm welcome to you, Professor Goyal, sir. May I request Professor Harish, sir, to kindly welcome Goyal, sir. Welcome to you, sir. And uh, today, the focus of this uh, plenary session is what is the uh, road ahead for the uh, implementation of NEP, both school education as well as higher education. 
and NEP envisages a holistic, multidisciplinary education. Most of our higher educations in the state of Karnataka, as well as several parts of the country, calls themselves as institutions offering multidisciplinary. But uh, most of the institutions offers monodisciplinary education. Even those which have multi, multiple streams and uh, disciplines have been doing uh, the monodiscipline structure. And what strategies would be best to transform these institutions into holistic, multidisciplinary higher education institutions as it is envisaged by national education policy and as per the guidelines of the University Grants Commission. So this is the focal point probably with uh, this uh, framework uh, we can deliberate and finally we can have the outcome of this plenary session. Also, the change makers and the, uh, the force behind implementation, rather the change makers are the teachers and the faculty members at the higher education level as well as school education. More particularly, when it comes to higher education, all these years and several decades, we were given, uh, we were trained on uh, pedagogy uh, for this uh, monodisciplinary education. Now, largely, most of our faculty members are not trained on multidisciplinary pedagogy. So that is the greatest challenge. And uh, therefore, uh, how it is possible and how uh, do we approach faculty empowerment considering the massive number? Because there is a large chunk of uh, teachers who are in the domain of higher education. So how to train them? Because it is only through the teaching fraternity the national education can be policy can be implemented. So what pedagogy, the pedagogy for a multidisciplinary approach can be trained for the faculty members. So what is the best uh, suitable approach for training the faculty and through faculty how best we can implement effectively national education uh, policy in the years to come. So with uh, these uh, two initial aspirations of this plenary session, May I request Professor Ramchandran sir, the chair, chairperson of this plenary session, to kindly present his uh, initial remarks. Over to Professor Ramchandran sir. Thank you, Dr. Ravindra. We are slightly running behind schedule, so initial remark I limit to only two minutes. If you look at the policy, uh, there are four key words in it the, and four sentences. The first sentence talks about recognizing, identifying, and nurturing the unique talent of each individual to promote one's holistic development. The first phrase I would like to highlight is Flexibility. flexibility in choosing the trajectories of education, choice of programs of study, choice of courses within programs of study. So flexibility is the one. Third, a very important uh, statement, honoring student diversity. I am deliberately using the term honoring student diversity and not managing, not addressing, because diversity is seen as an asset and not a liability. And the last key word in the policy is what is referred to as autonomy. Autonomy to the institutions, faculty, to design the program or study, to teach it, and to assess it. The multidisciplinary concept is in this context. I'll come back to that later. Since time is short, I'll call upon Dr. Prasanna Kumar to make his presentation for about 15, 20 minutes. And we may take two, three questions after each presentation. He'll be followed by Professor Goyle for another 15 minutes presentation 
followed by again a few questions, and I'll take about 20 minutes later on. Dr. President Kumar, you may commence your presentation. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, K. Ramchandranji, uh, Dr. Muralidhar, who uh, introduced me, and my colleague, panelist, Yugang Goelji, and friends who are here from all over the country. Very nice to see you. So when I see uh, the galaxy of people here, sometimes I'm, I'm enamored, sometimes I'm enthused, sometimes I'm frightened. So when I'm speaking, I will have all these three things in me. When I'm, You can uh, probably point out which point I'm, I'm enamored, which point I'm stunned, or when, I, when am I frightened. So uh, national education policy talks about that flexibility component I'll be focusing mostly. It's about uh, multiple entry, multiple exit. So I was asked to uh, focus on the four-year degree. I don't consider it as a four-year degree. It is a four degrees in one degree, if you want to look at it as one degree. But it is four degrees, basically. One year is a certificate. Second year is a diploma. Third year is a degree. And fourth year is honors degree, which would mean that four different universities, four different parts of the country, student being exposed to the cultures of four different universities and four different parts of the country. That's what I'm looking at. That is student getting the opportunity to see four different parts of the country and the institutional cultures, and the teacher also getting the opportunity to see four different parts of the students, students from the four different parts, which would mean that the teacher will have to work on non-familiar student every year non-familiar student, and the student should be uh, ready for non-familiar environment of the college or the institution that he is getting into, he or she is getting into. Second thing is I'm also looking at not continuing the class after first year. I would consider that it is useless to consider continue after first year for most of them. For, mo for the rest of them, it is not useful to continue after second year. For some of them, it is not useful to continue after third year. And for those people who are caught in the fourth year, they better do their PhD and get out. So uh, that's how I look at it. I look at it, uh, I look at the public uh, administration system, public recruitment system to stop talking about graduation as important uh, uh, basis for getting into public service. They should make diploma as important basis so that people will quit in the second year. We have a system today where a student gets into a vestibule of the train called as uh, education, where he gets into LKG and gets out at PhD without earning anything on the way. He is very, very cozy in the cozy environment of the train, air-conditioned Rajdhani train, traveling long distance, happily taken care of, bed is there, food is there, toilet is there. Everything is there. Suddenly, from the train, he gets onto the platform where nothing is there. And then we, we say that he's educated. He is enamored, actually, not educated with the reality. He is not able to handle the reality. We call our education as a noun, by, by its noun. We need to shift from noun to verb. Education is not noun, it is verb. If we can create verb part of education in every sphere of knowledge, then we have a lot of space. If we are working on noun, there is no space already full. Every faculty is full with lot of curriculum, big syllabus, already enamored. So they need to get rid of the books. They need to get into learning to learn because those books have become old and they are not necessary for the student at all. 99% of what the student learns in the school or college is useless for him all the time in his life. Considering that it is useless, we should also work on what is useful. To get something, if a glass is full, if you want to get into that glass something, you cannot get it unless you empty it. So we need to learn to unlearn. Uh, learning to unlearn is not for the students, but for the faculty. All of us need to learn to unlearn, get rid of our thinking, traditional thinking, that big bloody textbook is there, I have to teach it somehow, catch the fellow in the classroom and harass him for the total semester, put everything possible in his head. If it is not possible, let it be in the textbook, but I will do whatever I can do. So from that, we need to shift to 
verb of education where the student only learns to learn. He doesn't learn any textbook content. He only learns how to learn science. He learns how to learn language. He learns how to learn social science. He learns how to learn mathematics. He learns how to learn, that's all. So that he can be a continuous learner because whatever we are learning today is going to be outdated, useless after five years. So that content part of learning to the verb part of learning, that is a method part of learning is what we have to shift. That's a huge shift. Teachers have to get rid of the textbooks. They have to get into the context books. Get the context into the classroom. I have one of my colleagues who was working on management teaching. She was, so she was handling HRM, human resource management. She said that she told the students, you do manpower planning. You consider that you are a boss. You have an organization. You, have recru you are recruiting. You are going to advertise. You are going to, uh, you are going to have people still selected. You are going to train them. All of that in the classroom. All of you have to do it in your classroom. You become an industry. You become a manufacturer. You engage people. You give wages. You negotiate wages you negotiate skills, you give job description, job enrichment, everything will be done by the student. There is no textbook. You are the context book. You better do it. And you do it in groups. That's how she's teaching the subject. I think that is the way we need to get into every subject. We need to get rid of thinking that language is pouring the person with some text and some poetry and some prose to learning the skill of language. We don't have people who can teach well, who, cannot, who can write well, even at the postgraduate level or even after PhD. That is the biggest problem that we are looking at. So uh, we, have, we have been talking about learner-centered education, teacher-centered education. It is better that we get into society-centered education, get rid of this learner-centered and teacher-centered learnings, which are self-centered learnings. They are not going to be of any help because if, we are, if our education is not addressing the needs of the society, how do you expect that society will take you and will take care of you? The education that we give is useless for the society. When it is useless for the society, your society will not use it. So what is that which is useful to the society if we can design the curriculum as the education curriculum, the national education policy gives, provides for? To, the teacher should have the flexibility to the extent of deciding what is the content of that particular course, rather than getting into the prescribed course, wo kaisa syllabus complete karna hai, kitna jaldi complete karna hai, kitna exam deke, kitna thokna hai, kitna usko beush karna hai, usme se humko bahar nikalna hai. We need to get into something which is skill oriented skill kaisa banta hai hamara education mein koi skill nahi banta in our education there is zero opportunity of skill so the student who comes out of our college he is going to be zero skilled fellow skill is built by repeatedly doing something in our total curriculum we don't have anything which is repeatedly doing only lesson ek bar lesson padhaya dusra teesra chauda pura lesson padhate gaya hai koi lesson repeat nahi kiya padhane mein bhi repeat nahi kiya aur karwane mein to kuch kara hi nahi so there is nothing which the student gets to do so when the teach the, when the student doesn't get to do he cannot learn any skill because swimming and cycling cannot be learned by doing courses in swimming and cycling or going online classes on swimming and learning cycling or doing a video lesson on skin uh, cycling and swimming. So that's what I have understood. So we've been going around the country. We've visited all RIEs, Regional Institute of Education. I've been with the NCRT faculty. I've been working with the management faculty across the country. We looked at how we can handle this. First year mein khali skill dena hai. First year mein koi content nahi dena hai. Nature, scope, causes, consequences ko phekna hai third year mein. Agar usko time hai zindagi mein, wo padega nahi to nahi padega. Don't give this introduction to nature, scope, all that rubbish is not required. Give him the skills so that at the end of first year, he will decide ram ram for the education. I will never get back to the education college at all. This present education system is serving the needs of faculty. It is not serving the needs of society. It is not serving the needs of student at all. So let's look at it at, in that perspective. Abhi net wali qualifications pe kaun lecturer banega? Kya competency hai? Lecturer competency koi nahi hai, but net lecturership hai. Ab lecturer wali designation bhi nahi raha hai. Wo lecturer wali designation nahi hai, why do you have lecturership? Aur usme usko koi competency of teaching nahi hai. Nowhere in the teacher, in the 
in the post graduation is any attempt done to give skills of teaching they are only skills of killing which is which are taught in the uh, in the uh, in the post graduate level because you are given content and content and content mug up or soon you are saying root learning root learning nahi karna hai root learning nahi karna hai itna bada kitab de diya hai wo kitab kaisa padhna hai क्या लिखना है कौन से इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन है इसमें हम लोग पढ़े हैं क्वेश्चंस लिखना नहीं है जिंदगी में लास्ट टाइम यू राइट योर क्वेश्चन आंसर इज इन योर कॉलेज दैट इज द एंड ऑफ इट द स्टूडेंट इज आस्ट टू डू वर्क इन द वर्ल्ड एंड द इनकॉम्पिटेंट फॉलो टू डू वर्क गेट्स इन टू दियर ऑफ वर्क ही विल नॉट बी एंगेज ही कैनॉट बी एंगेज उसको काम करना सिखाना है जाके कोई कोई इंस्टीट्यूशन में कोई फैक्ट्री में कोई जगह पर भाई आपको काम है एग्जाम लिखने का काम आप करेंगे ऐसा तो कोई नहीं पूछेगा आपको काम करना है ये पूछेगा यूर कॉम्पिटेंसी ऑफ डूइंग इज व्हाट इज आस्ट और व्हाट इज कॉल्ड फॉर नॉट राइटिंग द एग्जाम राइटिंग द एग्जाम इज ओनली इन द स्कूल और कॉलेज एंड वी टीच इन द स्कूल एंड कॉलेज ओनली टू राइट एग्जाम्स सो फ्रॉम देयर वी हैव टू गेट आउट Look at what is the need of the society. So, ये faculty development कैसा करना है? This was one point which came up in the initial intro. Faculty development करना है तो पहले faculty को दुनिया में ले जाओ, ये classroom में से निकाल के बाहर फेंको, उनको गांव में ले जाओ, पूछो आपका जो पढ़ाई करते करवाते हो, उससे क्या फायदा है? What is the benefit of whatever you are teaching in the classroom for this village? You are teaching botany, no? What is the use of your botany for this village? You are economics, no? What is the use of your economics for the village? You are technology, no? What is the use of your technology in the village? When you get into that, then we understand that most of the time, whatever we teach is useless. It can only help the faculty to earn their livelihood. So from there, we need to get out of, get out and get into the society and see how we can do engaged learning. Engaged learning में सवेरे when we were looking when we were listening to that Gauhati IIT director he was mentioning that in their campus they are having the factories different companies are set up there so that the students can get into engaged learning हम लोग तो engaged नहीं old age नहीं पूरा बंद करके room में ठोकने का system करते हैं उसको हम लोग education मानते हैं that is where we are actually frustrating people we are creating incompetency in the students. The education system today, educational institutions which we all are coming from, breed incompetence, make people useless for meeting the needs of the society. Hamara, when you have the learning outcome-based curricular framework in front of you, फिर बाद में national education policy आया है. I will close with this point. Learning outcome-based curriculum framework को national education policy को कोई connection नहीं है. अभी हम लोग जो पर करिकुलम पढ़ाते हैं या फालतू करिकुलम पढ़ाते हैं क्योंकि देर इज नो कनेक्शन ईच कोर्स नीड्स टू हैव लर्निंग आउटकम दीज लर्निंग आउटकम शुड बी लिंक टू ए सर्टिफिकेट कोर्स इन द फर्स्ट ईयर फर्स्ट ईयर सर्टिफिकेट प्रोग्राम इन द फर्स्ट ईयर सर्टिफिकेट प्रोग्राम इन द फर्स्ट ईयर करके बाहर जाने के लायक बनाने ऐसा नहीं कि हमको उसको रूम में बिठा के फिर ठोकना है सेकेंड ईयर में ऐसा नहीं है he should be competent to get into the world after first year if you are saying he is incompetent then the teacher is incompetent because he is making the student incompetent of facing the world after the first year we should be making the student competent of make meeting the world meeting the needs in the world at the end of first year waisa humko when you are looking at it your first year languages will have to hatao fai they should get into only half credit there is no requirement of that you need to know how to write hum log bolte hain padhate hain koi padhate nahi hum log hum log bolte rehte hain usko hum padhate bolte hain so in the classroom there is no padhna of the student every day the student has to speak every day the student has to write if we do not have that change in the classroom how will the student talk how will the student write we don't train the student what to write you don't train the student how to write in the classroom we give exam at the end hum log baat karte bachcha ko bolte tumko likho bachcha ko to sikhaya nahi likhna aur ye baat karna sikhna ye dono bhi useless hai society ke liye kyunki society mein koi bhashan dena nahi hai koi likhna nahi hai kaam karna hai kaam karna to hum sikhate nahi so that is where skilling is coming so friends when the school education is starting skilling 
फ्रॉम सिक्स्थ क्लास ऑनवर्ड्स वो स्किलफुल बंदा हमारा कॉलेज में आएगा वो हमको देखेगा बोलेगा राम राम कॉलेज को हम नहीं जाएंगे तुम्हारा कॉलेज को यहाँ पर बोरिंग करते हो आप हमको यूजलेस बनाते हो यहाँ पर सो बाई ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फाइव वी आर लुकिंग एट फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द स्कूल्स इन द कंट्री टू इंट्रोड्यूस स्किलिंग वोकेशनल एजुकेशन माने वोकेशनल एजुकेशन छः साल पढ़े सो बच्चा हमारे पास ट्वेंटी 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 थर्टी में आएगा ट्वेंटी थर्टी से हमारे कॉलेज में पहुँचेगा ट्वेंटी थर्टी टू में ट्वेंटी थर्टी टू ही विल एंटर इन टू अवर कॉलेज हैविंग गॉन थ्रू सिक्स ईयर्स ऑफ फील्ड इंट्रैक्शन जब आप बिठा के रूम में ठोकेंगे उसको यू कीप ऑन टॉकिंग अबाउट समथिंग नेचर स्कोप कॉजेस कॉन्सिक्वेंसेस ये पूरा हर सब्जेक्ट में वही होता है नेचर स्कोप कॉजेस कॉन्सिक्वेंसेस में बच्चा बहरान हो जाता है क्या पढ़ना है कैसा उसको मगअप करना है नेचर स्कोप कॉजेस कॉन्सिक्वेंसेज में कोई सीखने का कॉन्सेप्ट है क्या कोई सीखने का स्किल है फर्स्ट ईयर इज कर्म योगा सेकेंड ईयर इज भक्ति योगा थर्ड ईयर इज ज्ञान योगा फर्स्ट ईयर स्किल एनी ग्रेजुएशन फर्स्ट ईयर शुड बी ओनली स्किल विथ सर्टिफिकेट द स्टूडेंट शुड हैव द स्किल टू लीड द वर्ल्ड सेकेंड भक्ति योगा सम क्वालिटी एग्जेक्टिव फर्स्ट ईयर इज वर्ब सेकेंड ईयर इज एग्जेक्टिव थर्ड ईयर इज नाउन हम लोग उल्टा पढ़ाते हैं हम लोग फर्स्ट ईयर नाउन पढ़ाते हैं उनको पूरा नेचर कॉज डेफिनेशन ये पूरा पढ़ा के उसको खत्म कर देते उसका कॉम्पिटेंसी को खत्म कर देते वो बैठ के सुनने का एग्जाम लिखने का सीखता है एंड वी एक्सपेक्ट दैट फेलो विल बी यूजफुल टू द सोसाइटी कैसा यूजफुल होगा यूजलेस ही होगा कोई कॉम्पिटेंसी सीखना नहीं है कोई स्किल बिल्डिंग नहीं है एंड वेर एवर पीपल आर रनिंग अवे इन टू द प्राइवेट इंस्टीट्यूशन और इंस्टीट्यूशन विच आर गेटिंग एम्प्लॉयमेंट प्लेसमेंट एक्सेट्रा वहां पर क्या होता है ओनली स्किल बिल्डिंग होता है कोई नॉलेज विलेज नहीं होता है वो लोग सिलेबस वैसा बाजू में रखते हैं और सोसाइटी से इंटरेक्शन कराते हैं दे विल एवरी डे ग्रूम द स्टूडेंट्स टू वेयर नाइस ड्रेस एंड से गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड इवनिंग सर लाइक दिस एंड बाई दैट द एटलीस्ट इज गेटिंग इन टू द वर्ल्ड ऑफ वर्क हम वर्ल्ड ऑफ वर्ड में से वर्ल्ड ऑफ वर्क को जाना है वर्ड टू वर्क हमारे एजुकेशन शुड बी फोकस्ड ऑन वर्क नॉट ऑन दी वर्ड आई एम नॉट टॉकिंग समथिंग विच इज रिटोरिक बट आई एम बींग वेरी वेरी रियलिस्टिक every class every course the teacher has to look at what is the skill that i am giving here agar mai kuch bhi skill nahi kar nahi deti hu to mera zindagi faltu hai that is what the teacher has to look at what is the skill the student is getting out of my one one semester course or one year course if i am not giving skill to the student just i am collecting salary and putting it in my pocket if the target for my child whom i am feeding and the target for the child who is in my classroom who is feeding me if there are two different things if we want our children to be competent but we want our students to write exams then we have different agenda we are being hardcore hypocrites that will not work this is an opportunity for us education policy walon ko 2040 tak time hai एजुकेशन इंस्टीट्यूशन को 2030 तक टाइम है लेकिन बच्चा को आज का जिंदगी आज लीड करना है ही हैज टू फेस द वर्ल्ड टुडे जस्ट बिकॉज यू हैव टाइम टिल 40 और 47 और 55 और 70 और 80 डोंट गो बाय दैट योर रिटायरमेंट एज योर रिटायरमेंट एज इज डिफरेंट फ्रॉम द स्टूडेंट्स गेटिंग इनटू द वर्ल्ड एज वी नीड टू फोकस ऑन द स्टूडेंट गेटिंग इनटू द वर्ल्ड थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर गिविंग मी दिस पेशेंट लिसनिंग आई विल बी रेडी टू आंसर एनी क्वेश्चंस wonderful uh, presentation uh, with a realistic approach and uh, your uh, presentation was well received then uh, you when you said it is not the student centric or teacher centric it is society centric student engagement and giving them the hands on experience uh, we will be able to take one or two questions if uh, anybody wants to yeah Yes, sir. Please kindly tell your name and quickly you can directly ask the question. This is to Professor Prasanna Pras Kumar, sir. Uh, namaste. Uh, thank you for very energetic uh, and very practical uh, presentation. Uh, you made some points on uh, multidisciplinary approach and also on the skill aspect. Uh, the challenge we are having here is uh, skill. needs you know from childhood a child has to do it 
It's, it cannot be taught in the head. Uh, the multidisciplinary also is a behavior that has to be cultivated in, in children from an early childhood to see the connectedness between things and the subjects that they're learning. Uh, the, it requires a policy level uh, or a systemic uh, connections to be brought, you know, not only in the education, but also in the social aspect which you brought, up, brought out, that society should see the usefulness in what we are teaching children. My, my point and question here is, uh, uh, if we are expecting, you know, our children to be taught by best teachers who can bring skill, if you're expecting our children to be, uh, you know, taught by people who have really done things, you know, how can a B.A. degree be given to a farmer or, you know, to a, uh, uh, to a weaver? Because without learning from people who have skills in the society, we cannot be useful for the society. So where is the scope uh, in our, you know, approach towards education to integrate this social aspect or the economic aspect, and make these children useful uh, for the society. Professor Prasant Kumar, let me first compliment you and congratulate you to have exposed us to a very relevant and then highly required uh, uh, intervention from the part of the society towards the educational development. My name is Professor Madhav. I teach at the Institute of Finance and International Management. I'm also incidentally the Dean of Research. I was also formerly Chairman of Public Service Commission of Karnataka. <clears throat> I must really compliment for two important uh, things. I've also extensively traveled. I've also extensively traveled. But based on the point that you have made, education, unless the education is made society-centric, you, made the, you have really hit the point. What we have completely missed altogether till now is this particular aspect. I think Professor Ramachandran would agree with me, including uh, Goyal, because he is an expert on public policy. Because unless this particular product of education is connected with the society as to what we need to give, how we need to give, and to whom we need to give, and why to need to give. Unless these questions are clarified, you know, education as a product, as you have rightly pointed out, we have seen it as just noun, not as verb. I, I think uh, he is nodding his head. He is an educationist. Uh, you hit the point. I must congratulate you on that. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we have a lot of respect to this uh, NEP which has come after 40 years of independence or 75 years of independence. But unfortunately, we have not been able to connect the people in terms of with the education, with the needs of the society. So therefore, it needs to be looked into on integrating the social needs of the education. That's number one. Point number two, uh, it's again, I want your intervention on this. This is exactly a question. Why we have not been able to look into the aspect of globalization of Indian education? I don't think we have never tried. I have already, I, I worked as a faculty of four or five uh, global institutions, including the UK. In one of my visits as a professor, I saw a guy who was working here in Bangalore as a principal with the PhD, two PhD, when he went to abroad, none of his degree were recognized. None of the degrees were recognized. And over and above, we have started our journey of globalization. I think Ramchandran would agree with me. About 30, 31 years back, in 1991, we have started our journey. What uh, Goyalji, I think you agree with me. From 31 years, we have been globalizing our process. But unfortunately, we never want to integrate the Indian education to the global, global standard. What is this? I want your uh, uh, reflection on this particular issue. Thank you, sir. Issue, Professor, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor Initially, uh, Prasanna Kumar, sir, will Prasana take two Kumar questions, and then we'll definitely give. Prasana, yes, sir, definitely we'll consider. Like yeah, yeah. 
Please, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll give you opportunity later. Please, sir. One minute. He is saying I should talk first after sir, you. Sir, it's a connection with the same question. Yeah. So Go I ahead. just put. So in in a nutshell, I just want to tell: Are we ready to? I who who is willing to provide the ecosystem for this development of skills? And in education, where a student we have 80 students in a classroom, and one year you learn everything. How do we account and assess the students? Is it is just in this connection? Whose whose responsibility is this going to be? I wanted to. Have. Thank you, madam. Yeah. <coughs> I um, I can take other questions. Anyway, I'll be there till the evening. I am also learning. I am not saying I am learned. I never think I will be learned and in till my end of my life. Uh, the point which you raised about uh, space in the curriculum, space in the time. Uh, in a in a class of 40 minutes, how many sentences you speak? This is the question which I asked across the country. We've conducted 14 national conferences, national workshops in the last uh, uh, two months. Okay. So I ask them, what is, how many sentences you speak? Per minute, you speak some eight to 10 sentences into 40, okay? 10 sentences into 40 is 400 sentences you will speak probably. Suppose you reduce that 400 sentences to 120 sentences or 100, and, sorry, 200 sentences. Is any principal coming into the classroom and shouting at you? Is the university shouting at you? Is anybody elsewhere in the country or anywhere getting into your classroom and checking how many sentences you are speaking? So if you reduce the number of sentences to 200 from 400, you have a space of 200 sentences space. Out of the 200 sentences space, you give 100 sentences space for the students to talk and 100 sentences to write. Every day, let the student write. Every day, let this, if you're only talking about write, language learning language learning bhi padhaya jata hai koi likhta nahi koi bolta nahi classroom mein padhaya jata hai to wo padhaye jane se we cannot learn any language so the skill of learning the language is by way of speaking and writing which is not taught in the classroom you have the opportunity of talking less and making the student to talk nobody is objecting to that there is no methodology, nobody, no governance, no UGC is coming into your classroom and checking how many sentences you are speaking. There are people who are brilliant who can speak only 200 sentences, give the space for the other 200 sentences to the students. That means every class throughout your career, 50% of your class will be taken by your students. Then this point of 40, 50, 60, 100 students coming. Fortunately, you have students coming. I know of state universities where no student comes to the classroom because they think that teacher is useless. Teacher also doesn't go to the classroom because he thinks that student is useless. Okay? And then at the end, they get first class marks. They will give first class marks so that there is no nuisance. No tension. They give marks. Next batch is certificate. Diya, khatam ho Next batch is. We have beards which are sold at 1,40,000 rupees. Including exam, they will flee, clear. Without exam, 1 lakh rupees. With, without classroom training, or, or teaching experience, internship experience, it is 1 lakh. With teaching experience, practically participating, it is 70,000. That is the rate of the degrees of teacher education happening. So teacher education degree is falso degree. It has no value in terms of outcome because there is no skill taught in the classroom. And when the student goes to the field, field stipend or whatever that uh, internship, he will give a fan, give the principal, the headmaster, a refrigerator, he will get his internship certificate. This is what is going on in our country. And then your point about how these people who are you know, who are skilled workers, how they can be brought into the classroom. National education policy provides umpteen space for adjunct faculty coming into. They don't need to have B.Ed. They don't need to have M.Ed. They just need to do the work the way they are doing and show the work and make the student do the work. What do we understand? See, science people come from the world, from the world, from the world. What do they do? In the classroom, the teacher experiments and they think that the student gets the experience. Teacher does the experiment, how the student will get the experience. If you do experiment, you will get experiment experience, not experience of doing the work. Doing experience ka hai, repeatedly when you do it, then only you will get the experience. Ek
use this term because the, the author himself used this as the title of the book. He, he quotes those jobs which the world can do without as bullshit jobs and he reminds us that the world can very well do without investment bankers also. So it's not that bullshit jobs are the less paid or low paid jobs. Bullshit jobs can be all around us regardless of the type of payments that can be given. Um, and uh, interestingly, the, the, interestingly, he argues that sometimes the most paid jobs are often the bullshit jobs. How have we come to a certain type of society where things that we don't need are actually the things that, that uh, seem to be the most important things? And I'll give you an example. As a teacher myself, uh, I have asked this to hundreds of my own students who have graduated and working in various industries. Um, how many of our students come to us and tell us they love their jobs? Um, and in fact, it's a, it's a matter of pride when the student comes to me and says, I, you know, I'm so happy in my job. But that will be one out of uh, 100, perhaps. Um, which, in other words, mean that we have created you, uh, we have taught you, we have, we have made, you know, you're employed extensively, uh, doing something that you don't like, buy, buying things that you don't need. Uh, so it takes, it takes mark of a genius to create a society like this, right? Um, and so, so, you know, hearing uh, Professor Prasanna Kumar uh, you know, help, uh, got me reminded of this. But it also, um, I was also reminded of it because of another reason. One of the ways in which we design our societies and structure our societies is the ways in which disciplines are organized in universities, um, which is what brings me to the idea of multidisciplinary and holistic education. Uh, so if you look at it closely, actually, this idea that you have to do a BA in economics or, uh, or an MA in, uh, so in, uh, in sociology, uh, or for that matter, BTEC in engineering, um, all of this disciplinary orientation is not more than 100 years old. In fact, if you look at the university level education uh, during 19th and before that, um, the disciplines were not so, such watertight containers. So what really happened during the World War, just before that and after that, is the demand for spe specialization improved, and the industry started arguing that we need people who are specialized in a certain discipline, which therefore fed into the universities and different kinds of disciplines started uh, being carved out. Um, which is the reason why many philosophers of the 19th, 18th, and 17th century were also mathematicians at the same time, and even lawyers for that matter. This, this, so in some sense, first of all, let us all accept and agree that the fact that somebody can study in one discipline to become an expert, and that is the ideal way to go ahead, is a very recent thing. It is not set in stone. Historically, that has never been the case. Our own minds don't think in specific disciplines. I can talk to you right now about Taj Mahal, and you will start thinking about it. I will then t t talk to you about Shah Rukh Khan and he'll start thinking about his movie. The next second, I'm going to talk to you about multidisciplinarity, and your mind will switch uh, in no time. We are students of problems. We are not students of disciplines. This is, what, this is a famous statement by Karl Popper, for instance. I did engineering, like most Indians. Um, and like most Indians, I did not continue with engineering. I moved to study law. Uh, and also economics. So I've studied basically three disciplines in various parts of the world, of course, as in India as well. Um, and one of the most powerful things that I've learned in studying courses which are, let's say, qualitative, like law, so to speak, and quantitative, like engineering or economics, um, uh, the statement, I mean, this is often attributed to Albert Einstein, but I don't think he, he, he made that statement, but I'll tell the statement anyway. Uh, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. You see, um, and this is the hallmark, this is the crux 
of why we need interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, holistic education. I'm not going to get into the specific details of the definitional aspects of it, but I do know that each of these terms, holistic, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, now they're using transdisciplinary, of course. Each of these terms get, fold into, get folded into each other. You cannot have holistic education if you don't have multidisciplinary education. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll quote, um, I'll, may, I'll, I'll tell two stories which might help us um, and you know, make us feel encouraged towards the idea of multidisciplinary education. And my own mapping of Indian universities, very few of them provided. And so this is like a tall order. At the same time, I will also give a list of few items that I have in mind in terms of institutional development plans that could potentially be carved out. I'm going to throw some ideas on the table. We don't have much time, but of course, happy to discuss this later. And this is always going to be a work in progress, like India, India is. Um, so, um, so you know, there's this person called Tricia Wang. She was employed by Nokia. We all know Nokia, right? The towering leader of mobile phones in the world um, and suddenly grazed to nothing. Uh, purchased by Microsoft, no one has even heard, uh, uh, heard of its name. In fact, students in my class often jokingly call it Nahi Kia because they didn't do anything. Now here's, here's something that happened. Um, in, the, in, the late, in 2010, 11 or so when smartphones were just about appearing, they wanted to find out whether they should invest in smartphone technology or they should continue with the type of telephones that they have, which is the button telephone, right? Um, and so they, they collected a lot of data, huge amount of data of millions of their customers trying to figure out what is their buying behavior. So they were looking at what you call as big data, right? Uh, we have, companies now sit on tons and tons of big data, very few of them know how to manage it. They also asked some people to do qualitative interviews of, uh, you know, of consumers, young, young boys and girls, what kind of phones do you like? So Tricia Wang was one of their employees who was doing these interviews in China, and her interviews were revealing that even low-income consumers are inclined to buy smartphones. Uh, they are actually looking forward to smartphone-driven life, even though they are low-income consumers. The big data, however, was showing Nokia that people don't, will not switch. The low-income consumers will not switch to smartphones, and therefore the board was, trying, was not deciding, was not in favor of making huge investments for smartphone technology. Do you see, do you see what I'm saying? So the big data is telling Nokia, low-income consumers will not purchase smartphones. This is 2008, 9, 10, 11 or so, right? The interviews, and Tricia Wang took an interview of around 100 young people in, in, in the hinterlands of China. There were some other people who were doing these interviews. When she was talking to people, she was realizing actually people want to buy it. Um, and in some sense, she was telling Nokia head office that listen, this is probably going to change the world. You should invest in smartphone technology. This is what my experience is. But her sample size was 100. And they had millions of data points where they saw the buying behavior of their consumers and they thought this is not going to happen. We know what happened, actually. Um, in some sense, Nokia's downfall in, is partly attributed to its negligence and igno to Nokia ignoring the qualitative interview data that was being populated by these small sample size figures. Um, this is called as thick data. So now, most companies realize that big data alone doesn't tell them what the future of the world will look like. It is a thick data that will tell them. In fact, most people who predict the future or want to predict the future, and we are talking about people who, you know, um, uh, Parashuraman sir was mentioning, the big picture, people who have to carry the big picture, they are all working on a lot of intuition which is coming in form of thick data. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that disciplines restrict our minds from navigating between big data and thick data across all the time, right? So there are some disciplines that are are going to talk about um, the society in a more qualitative manner. There are others which will focus on numbers. Um, they won't help each other if they don't talk to each other. This, this, is, this is the first, first interesting lesson. The other, the other story about this um, is something called diversity. And we know a lot about diversity. Um, in fact, speaking in an Indian audience is always far more pleasurable for me because I can see diversity in colors, cultures, languages, uh, you know, even, even probably the way, way we think. But interestingly, um, new research, so there's a lot of research that shows diverse teams do better, right? So if a team has male, females, if a team has rich and poor together, if a, te if a team has uh, people coming from different regions of the world or different parts of India, those teams will lead to, diff to better outcomes because different kinds of perspectives will come. But this research is not... Um, uh, this research is not without its own limitations. So there are some, so there are some studies that show it's, it, this is exactly how it happens. Some other studies show no, the, the, the impact is not significant. 
But there is one particular type of diversity that has consistently shown good results and outcomes. And I'll tell you what that diversity is. Um, that diversity is called as cognitive diversity. Uh, so there is overwhelming evidence now that if the team consists of people whose cognitive diversity is different, so people coming from different disciplines, actually it's not, they don't define it using disciplines, they define it using different perspectives of thinking. Um, it leads to much better outcomes. Um, and this directly correlates with the, the different type of thinking uh, that different disciplines generate. I know I was a different person when I was doing engineering. When I started studying law, I, I was thinking, I was looking at the world a little, dif little differently. The, um, and economics, of course, uh, made me more pessimistic. Thankfully, I'm doing public policy now, not as, as much of economics. But, uh, but this is something that we realized, right? So at some point, I was trying to do so, the skill development legislation of Andhra Pradesh, um, working with the uh, Nalsar University of Law. And this is a few years ago. And I invited some of my students uh, uh, who were law students. So earlier I used to be teaching in Jindal University, right? So I, I asked them, let's define how could we create this overarching law for skill development in the state. Um, after a week, I included a few liberal arts students into the same group. And the whole conversation changed. It was unbelievable. Because the points that these students brought forward, who were studying law in the third and fourth year, um, were far more restrictive. And they were looking at things in a standard, you know, boilerplate categories that liberal arts, that uh, law is, whereas it was a lot more creative when, it, when the other group, group was involved. And so, you know, with uh, Professor Bhushan Patwardhan and I, we were, we were discussing to write something on when NEP becomes an act, we really hope its essence is not lost in statutes because uh, the drafting of NEP into an act will really be the, the Achilles heel that has to be prote protected, so the essence remains. Anyway, but this reminds me, so cognitive diversity, I'll give you one more example, might be a little provocative. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's always fun to be, to be such. Uh, Diego Gambetta um, and Stephen Hertog, these are professors in LSE in Oxford. I think it was seven, eight years ago, they wrote this amazing book. They wrote a paper which then later on became a book called The Engineers of Jihad. Okay, so I'll tell you what is the argument. They collected a lot of data on Islamic fundamentalist terrorists, right? So people who have been convicted, um, particularly, um, they specifically looked at Islamic fundamentalism, uh, so in, the, in those regions, but of course affecting around the world, and they looked at their educational qualifications. So what is the largest educational qualification that makes up uh, terrorists in the world? This was the first study, and by the way, there is, this study is not without its limit, limits, but it has a lot of data, and they constructed a range of variables and large data set to back their claims. Guess what discipline features as, as the top discipline in the educational qualification of terrorists in, in the world? Oh, so, so you know what I'm talking about, right? So engineers were, so I mean, and then, you know, of course, the media houses started saying, well, if you study engineers, engineering, you will become a terrorist. And these guys had to come forward and say, no, that's not what we're saying. All we are saying is that there is some correlation that we find between educational qualification as an engineer and then becoming a terrorist. But, so, but, the, but the argument is not this. The argument is, is there something? Uh, so a part of the reason is because of kind of employment situation in the Middle East, for engineers and so on and so forth. Of course, those are part of the stories. But an interesting part of the story that they argued is that there is a certain way in which engineering mindset develops. And there is a certain way in which, I don't know, um, legal mindset develops, historian mindset develops, and so on and so forth. So intermingling of these mindsets is extremely important. Because what happens is, otherwise, there is a, there is, there is a large part of the world that remains untouched by somebody who's only doing one discipline. And hence the idea of multidisciplinarity is not to teach economics, to, to, is not to have an engineer become an economist. The idea is for an engineer to be exposed to how economists think by going through some of their discussions, their classes, their readings. Or economists to think about, I mean, economists is easy, but people who are doing arts and human literature to be exposed a little bit to mathematics. What is mathematical thinking after all? Because human minds um, are not disciplinary in nature. I'll give a few, um, just a couple of points in terms of uh, how could potentially the, uh, the institutional development plan could be done. Um, so I, have, I personally think there is a lot of anxiety uh, in my own engagements with higher education institution leaders and administrators about implementing, implementation of NEP. And I think some of it is misplaced because NEP as a whole is a heavy duty, tall order stuff right in the mind. But part of it is really, um, you know, a low, uh, low hanging fruit. Uh, which could be potentially done. So what we could uh, do is, um, so we do a mapping. So this, this is just a food for thought from, you know, on the table. We do a mapping of various co types of colleges and universities in, let's say, a state like Karnataka. 
We segregate them across different kinds of capacities that these institutions have. Some of them have higher capacities for digitalization, some of them have probably low, and so on and so forth. We pick up some of those who are closer to arriving at, uh, to being NEP compliant. And NEP compliance is not zero and one, I think it's a, it's a spectrum, right? It's like um, um, between zero and one, not zero and one, it's like fuzzy logic, right? Um, and so their, some of their practices, so they become mentor institutions to other institutions in their vicinity or in another place in the same state. In all my conversations, I think this mentoring is extremely, so not, not that it is, not only that it is crucial, but I think it is also easy. Because once an institution mentors another, and we have very few such examples in India. We have one IIT mentoring another IIT, uh, but uh, really what we would hope is uh, that an IIT mentors a non-IIT as well. And, and, and that is what is going to create that inspiration within the mentee institution to cultivate its multidisciplinarity and holistic education elements. And some of it can be brought into the curriculum, into the framework relatively easily. So I'll give you one example that we do at, what we do at Flame. Um, we have five, six universes of disciplines, right? So each universe comprises of five, six subjects. So let's say one universe is fine arts. So it will have uh, drama, theater, uh, painting, uh, music, and so on and so forth. Another one will comprise of subjects that are mo more uh, related to, let's say, literature. All students have to take at least one subject from each universe. So by the time they're graduating, they have definitely been exposed in one way or the other, to all kinds of different potential, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, offerings in form of a subject. Now, I know that this is difficult for those institutions where such subjects don't even exist. And that is why this mentoring is needed. So I don't think this is going to be an easy one, but I don't think it is very difficult either. And so this idea of mentor institutions with mentee, and maybe one mentor institution can have three, four mentee institutions, continuous monthly meetings with them, um, engaging with the faculty members and the chancellors, so vice chancellors or the directors of the institutes uh, could potentially create the idea of multidisciplinary, could at least sow the seeds of multidisciplinarity. Um, there are a few other ideas, but I think I should stop here um, in, the, in the interest of time. Um, but um, but let, me, let me also put forth uh, something which is happening in the, in, you know, globally in higher education institutions. You know, STEM disciplines, the, the traditional STEM disciplines are now, there is a huge steam for STEM disciplines to become STEAM disciplines. So the introduction of A in between uh, is essentially the introduction of arts. So you cannot have STEM discipline students not doing arts um, and the other way around. In fact, I should also tell you, one of the most coveted jobs in Silicon Valley right now is for those who have had studied philosophy back in the days. Because uh, when you create an AI, uh, you also need to create its, uh, you need to figure out what kind of code you want to give to the self-driven car if the car has to kill a, kill a man and a woman, and if killing is inevitable, who will the car kill has to be codified into the, into the program. And that cannot be told by engineers, I hope so at least. The, thanks a lot for this. Thank you very much, Professor Goyal, sir. And uh, now uh, our, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Chairman, sir, will uh, uh, take over. And uh, after his presentation, we will have a, uh, a question answer session. So, thorough question answer session will be followed after Chairman Sir's presentation. Yes, Thank sir. you, Ravindran. Well, let me get into the topic holistic and multidisciplinary. When we were drafting the policy, we used to remember an example from industrial and organizational psychology. The example goes like this. Once in a company, a machine went out of order. The chief executive officer of the company invited a few engineers to find out what went wrong and how we can make it functional. They could not do it. Then an ordinary mechanic came and asked the CEO, sir, may I have a look at the machine? In five minutes, he had a look at the machine. He tapped at various places and asked the CEO, may I have a hammer? You know, hammer to hit. He was given a hammer. He hit the machine at three places and the machine started functioning. The problem was jamming. He went and sent back, sent a bill to the CEO, 
and the CEO said for hitting three times, you are charging $1,000? He said, sir, for hitting three times, I charge only $30. To find out where exactly should I hit, I charge $970. Now, the point made by Dr. President Kumar is this. There is a feeling that in the education system, not only in India, elsewhere as well, we are producing a large number of graduates who know how to hit, but don't know where to hit. That diagnostic ability is not there, and the student is not a problem solver. So in policy, therefore, when we are drafting, we gave the highest importance to these problem-solving skills, as he rightly mentioned. Second, now I'm getting into this, holistic development. What does that mean? In a simple form, it means a student is, in terms of development, all human capacities, intellectual capacity, aesthetic capacity, physical development, emotional development, social development, ethical development practices, and moral development, all in an integrated form. If you want to make a student to develop intellectually, physically, aesthetically, socially, emotionally, ethically, morally, this cannot be done by studying only a single discipline. It needs a multidisciplinary approach. Sir used three terminologies, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary. I go back to a, an author of an article which you might have read, Park and Cho. They defined, I am adapting their thinking to explain to you, and when I finish, you will never forget that. They said the multidisciplinary is something like a salad. When you and I eat a salad, you find capsicum separately, tomato separately, cucumber separately, and so on. But together, by retaining the boundaries of these vegetables, they make a tasty salad. Like once when I was in the United States, I went to the designing of a financial model here. I entered the room, I found four computer designers, not programmers alone, computer designers, four economists and four physicists. I said, I understand the presence of economists and computer scientists to design a financial model. What do these physicists do here? Came back, reply, the financial volatility can be explained by using the Brownian motion in physics. Brownian motion, how it moves. That means that team was an interdisciplinary team engaged in financial model designing. They kept the discipline boundaries, but together it became a multidisciplinary team. Term interdisciplinary is like, you know, we eat dal, dal tadka, or sambar when you go eat a dosha. When you look at that, the gravy of the sambar or dal tadka, you can't distinguish. They have gelled together to give the taste of dal tadka or thing. This is what you call interdisciplinary. The boundaries of each discipline is slightly blurred, joined together, and deal with a problem. Third term used to was transdisciplinary. What does that mean? The example is a cake. You know, we all eat a piece of cake. You can't distinguish anything 
that this is this part, the ingredients cannot be distinguished, completely merged, take tackling as a particular problem. That is what we call transdisciplinary thing. In Bangalore, we have a transdisciplinary university. So the reason for multidisciplinary approach, as indicated in the policies to develop, what you call a student holistically. That is the idea. And then the question comes, you know, I think he raised the digital. What you're talking is, whom are we teaching in future? A student who is raised and brought up in a technology-rich environment. Second, they will use technologies which have not been invented so far. Five years, you don't know what will happen to this mobile phone. Third, many of our students in future will enter jobs which don't exist now. Like who thought of self-driven car five years ago? Or metro being run by driverless metro? Does it mean we lose a job? I say the role of a teacher changes. You may not teach directly. I saw that robots teaching in China. Whenever I go, I see that. The teachers asked me, will we lose my job? I said, no, you will be a designer for the robo and the lessons. So you find that the role of faculty changes in a university. So that is the reason we are talking about multidisciplinary talent. Uh, I had a chance, I was there in uh, US at that time. We talked to Steve Jobs, late Steve Jobs, the Apple computer designer. We asked him a question. How could you design the Apple Macintosh? Reply came, I had a multidisciplinary team. In addition to computer designers, my team was, had good musicians, good visual art person, and that multi-talented team designed the beautiful Apple Macintosh. It means what they are now looking for is a multidisciplinary talent and not a single disciplinary one. And therefore, practically what are we talking? A four-year undergraduate program. I am asked this question wherever I go, even yesterday, university asked me a question. When you say multidisciplinary, are you trying to create a person, what you call jack of all, and not master of any? I corrected. In the policy, there is a sentence. When we have multidisciplinary courses, we also have one area, one disciplinary or interdisciplinary area, say for about 60 credits as a specialization. I take physics as a specialization, 60 credits in three-year degree program. Then I also have two 20-credit program as minors. What would that minor could be? My major is physics. One of the minors would be music, musicology. 20 credits. Skill, as he rightly said, not superficial. The next program could be a vocational program. Hospitality, hotel management, and so on. So you find your product, once they come out, becomes a skilled person. When I say skill, I don't mean technical skill alone. Every subject has a skill. Like a literature person, uh, English language or Canada language, that person has a skill, say, to translate from English to Canada. Tra that is the kind of skill you are talking about. It. Now, since time is short, I take one more case. Now, when we are doing this, a question is asked that when you are multidisciplinary, what else you need? I say maybe six credits each in two languages. 
focused on communication skills, refined communication skills. When I joined the Regional College of Education, Mysore, long back, my English was not that good. But I had a professor from Oxford, Professor Brown. He had a pedagogy of teaching English language, correct the student on the spot if the student makes a mistake. One day I reached 30 seconds late to his class. At the door I asked, Professor Brown, can I come in please? Reply came, Ramachandran, you can, but you may not. I didn't get what he said. Then I thought I made a mistake in my tense. So I said, I changed can to could. Professor Brown, could I come in please? Reply came, you could, but you might not. <laughs> then I linked can, may, could, might. I realized seeking permission is not can or could, may I come in. I asked Professor Brown, may I come in? He said, please do come in. <laughs> then, Mursa Pucha, a Hindi me kya hoga? I said, can I come in? Me under aap paunga kya? The may I come in? Me under asakta. Look at the fineness of language. Me under aap paunga kya? Me under asakta. Look at that is the kind of communication skills you are talking. So if I quickly say time is short, what we are trying through a multidisciplinary study is the graduate attributes, a problem solver, a critical thinker, as morning mentioned by uh, Professor Sidharam. Why? Why? If you are a student of economics, when the budget is presented, you ask a question. Is this budget job-oriented? Jobless growth, cultureless growth, environmentless growth, and so on. That is a kind of critical thinking. Third is what you call creative thinking. If I ask all of you to redesign the logo of Ramaya College, I'll get 300 logos. No single answer. That shows your creativity and how we can do that. Then comes, very rightly mentioned in the morning, Team player, working in teams. Japanese have a very nice way of saying, if individually an Indian works, she or he is equivalent to three Japanese. But when three Indians join together, they become one third of a Japanese. We try to outsmart other, not a team player, excel in things, so the policy Multidisciplinary study also is that. Can we pre create students who can work in a team? Then I mentioned already skilled communicator, digitally literate and skilled, without which we can't progress further. Then ethical and moral reasoning, very important. Uh, the moral values, I think we have uh, our colleague from Janaka University, I remember an incident quoted by in our readings. Once a Chinese came to meet Chanakya. Then he asked, can you find out, did he come for a personal visit or an official visit? Chanakya just told for a personal visit. The person came around 3.30. He said, please ask him to wait up to 4.30. 4.30, Chanakya said, can you bring the lamb from my house? Take this lamb away. He did it. When the lamb was brought from home, this attendant said, sir, both the lambs are same. Why are you changing it? He said, that earlier lamb was my official lamb. This is my personal lamb. Because he came for a personal visit. And look at the values. Don't misuse official facilities and properties. So this is the kind of thing we are talking, ethical and moral values. Plagiarism is not practiced. Can you have 
ethical practices built in. That is the idea. I'll end by saying, does it mean there are no learning outcomes related to disciplinary, interdisciplinary areas? Yes, four. Number one, a coherent understanding of a discipline, linkages between different branches of discipline, like you are talking, if you are a graduate becoming chemistry, linkage between organic, inorganic, pharmaceutical, physical, analytical chemistry. That one should have. If you are talking about economics, microeconomics, macroeconomics, econometrics, and so on. So that engages one. Second is what you call, in a multidisciplinary context, procedural knowledge. If I want to be an economist, what should I learn? If I want to be a teacher, what should I learn? If I want to be a physicist, what should I learn? Procedural knowledge in our curriculum. Third point made by Prasanna Agma, that uh, skills, skills related to analysis of elements in chemistry, skills related to building a bridge, building a house. Fourth is what you call application. Can we apply what is taught through our subject areas in a real life situation? So we are specializing in an area. We have coherent understanding of a subject area. We have procedural knowledge. We have skills related to that. We have capability to apply. These we call disciplinary, interdisciplinary, or transdisciplinary areas of learning. Then comes general, generic learning outcomes, which students of all programs of study should undergo. Mentioned problem solving, critical thinking, creative thinking, uh, skilled communicator, digital skills, and so on, and that. That is the multidisciplinary and the holistic development. And therefore, I look forward to the day when I have economics as a major, I have music college as my minor, and a vocational program as second minor. It can also be reversed. Vocational program is a major, I may have allied thing as a minor and see. But in addition to that, we must have a three credit program on environmental education. This is a Supreme Court directive. Every student should have what you call capability to use digital and technological solutions in education. A core course, three to four credits. Every student should have two languages focused on communication skills and so on. Coupled with what you are talking in a holistic level, 25% of the courses we transact should have field-based learning as an aspect. Field-based learning, then to make it societal thing, as you said, community engagement and service as an integral part of an undergraduate master's program. So you find that, I am asked a question, which will be asked to you also. If you make it multidisciplinary and reduce the credit from 90 I teach, if I make it 60, will I lose my job? The answer I have is, when you teach theory, it is 15 hours per credit per semester. When you teach field-based learning, practicum, it is 30 hours. In addition to that, you add student engaged time. When I say theory, give 15 hours in the classroom, 30 hours to the student to go to the library, prepare for it, prepare for the classes. It means one credit notionally becomes 45 hours of learner engaged time. In practicum, 30 hours plus 50 more hours to prepare for the practical. And if you do that, the faculty engaged time will remain the same. So no fear of losing jobs and so on. 
So therefore, an advocacy from your side, when we introduce multidisciplinary programs, as I mentioned earlier, together with the concurrent field-based learning, together with the community engagement and service, you will point. I know, uh, David is looking at it, so I may uh, have to stop at it. Conclusion, I say, the purpose of multidisciplinary studies is to promote holistic development so that you have a student developed in terms of intellectually, aesthetically, socially, uh, emotionally, morally, ethically. That is the major message from the policy, that the word holistic development is the most important. To do that, we propose a multidisciplinary strategy. Thank you very much. No, I think Thank no. you very much, sir, for Thank a you. comprehensive uh, presentation covering various dimensions of holistic uh, multidisciplinary approach to transform the higher education. And the purpose of holistic multidisciplinary approach, as you said, is to nourish the critical thinking, problem solving, and decision making abilities of the learners and uh, making them uh, a comprehensive, complete, contemporary citizen and with a societal oriented approach and with this uh, right attitude, right skill set and right uh, contemporary knowledge. So thank you very much for uh, your... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Con yeah, yeah. Contemporary and uh, comprehensive presentation, sir. I think we can take only two questions. We are running short of time. Uh, kindly, please. Sir. And second one, yeah. Sir, straight question, sir, please. Right. To lec yeah. I don't want to lecture the uh, honorable speakers, but. Uh, I just had a, maybe a fused question. So the first part to uh, Dr. Prasan Kumar. Um, I, I am a little uh, uh, troubled by reducing the idea of skill to merely uh, skills that sort of uh, encourage vocational uh, training. Because after all, thinking is a skill. Uh, uh, and uh, especially if we are talking about integrating uh, disciplines in, in a modern context, these are very uh, rigorous disciplines in themselves. So you can't undermine uh, this by some kind of vigilantism saying, look, let's just take from society and let's, let's just, you know, common sense. You don't need to def define things. I think this is a problematic thing. In the connection of that, I have a question for uh, Professor Goyal. Uh, that it's very good that, uh, I mean, you quoted Karl Popper and uh, that you think, you conceptualize in terms of problems. But I think we shouldn't forget that there's something called reductionism. And that's a very powerful notion. And it's because of uh, perhaps a reductionist principle that we are dividing things into disciplinary domains. And you need the disciplinary domain, you need the training in that in order to break those barriers. Because after all, if you conceive of things simply in terms of problems, they're messy. And uh, I'm a physicist, and when you, when you do something, you isolate the experience. That's why you do an experiment. So uh, yes, sir. I want your comments. Yeah, thank you, sir. Take one more question. Yeah, yeah. Last question, we will take, uh, yeah, please. This is the last question. Yes, sir. And you can interact with the resource persons during so the lunch. It's been quite an erudite session. I am Professor Joyjit Chakraborty from the Bhavanipur Education Society College, University of Calcutta. Now, I have one question, sir. Uh, it's encouraging to see that this session has brought up some important and multifaceted dimensions of NEP and how teachers would be the centrifugal force behind bringing the institutional change. But sir, I have one question, rather two, two aspects which are needed to be encompassed. Firstly, if we are expecting the best out of the teachers, why don't we pay the best to the, why don't we reciprocate by giving the best pay to the teachers? 
if we are expecting the best from them, so why don't we reciprocate the same by giving a good pay packet? Because I believe that lots of teachers at various private universities across different parts of India are subjected to an abysmal pay scale, which does not really justify to their skills. And secondly, I find it utterly frustrating that why does a PhD in a country, in our country, earn less than a tier two MBA graduate? Because that, that is also something which needs to be covered. Thank so, you, sir. So My request, sir. Prasanna Kumar, sir, to take the questions and then go in, sir. Yeah, um, thinking is a skill. I have no, uh, no conflict with that. Uh, basically, I am struggling with the con context of 1,000 students who come to our college or our university. Out of them, only two of them become teachers. One of them become researcher opportunities of employment, of teaching and learning where thinking is required most of the time is three out of thousand. I am only worried about the 997 of them who become Nagharka, Naghatka. That is the point. As far as your question of uh, uh, the uh, payment is concerned, uh, salary of the faculty is concerned, uh, अगर हमारा पास एजुकेशन के लिए स्टूडेंट पे नहीं कर सकता तो आता है। He cannot, he is not having the capacity to pay. If he is not having willingness to pay, capacity to pay and willingness to pay when they are not there, then our payment will be less. So willingness भी रहना है, capacity भी रहना है। so uh, if, this, if the expectation from the teacher is big, that student also doesn't have expectation, the faculty also doesn't have expectation, the college also doesn't have expectation. None of them have any expectation. So that's why we get 20,000, 18,000, 16,000, 12,000, 7,000. I have seen a uni uh, faculty who was teaching post-graduation for 6,000, okay? so. Um, अगर हम दस रुपए का दूध लीटर चाना चाहते हैं तो वो दस रुपए में भी मिलेगा पांच रुपए में भी लीटर मिलेगा वो व्हाइट कलर रहेगा पानी कोई आपको सौ रुपए वाला लीटर भी मिलेगा सो आई एम नॉट सेइंग दैट यू शुड बी पेड लेस और द टीचर शुड बी पेड लेस but the competency of the society, actually requirement of that particular program. Actually, majority of our courses or programs that we are running are not required for the society. Jo required hai, uske liye zyada paisa pay karenge, wahan par jayenge. Jahan par required nahi hai, ghar mein kuch bhi karke, there is no work at home, there is no work in the society, so go to the college. That is the system that presently we have. So people are going to the college because it's a vestibule train, one compartment to other compartment to other compartment, LKG to PhD. So you are going. Majority of them are doing it. Why are you studying? They don't know why they are studying. We have objectives, just in NAP we have, uh, in LOCF also we have learning objectives and uh, the um, transaction objectives, course objective. Hota hai. Who understands these course objectives? We were doing a workshop with the RIE students of uh, Mysore and also the students of rural management in XIMB, uh, Bhuvaneshwar, when we gave this opportunity for the students to redesign the curriculum, they completely trashed whatever is being taught now. They said that this is not of any use to us. You get rid of a lot of these things. So, but then we are, we love the curriculum so much that we are teaching because traditionally our teachers, 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 teacher, as he was saying, sir, last 100 years it has been taught. August Kunt ka beta, aur wo Durkheim ka beta, Karl Marx ka beta, uska bete ka bete ka beta. I'm talking about the intellectual beta. So intellectual betas are there in every area. So the intellectual betas will go by the tradition of the BAP. They will go by the fathers or the seniors. That paradigm thing about Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn talks about this uh, paradigms. This paradigm story is all about the way we conduct, we transact education. That is why we are stuck with something like that. It's, it's something which we can work on, we will work on. Ham log below average hai, student below average hai, society below average hai, below average payment milega. Thank you, sir. Go so very, very quickly, yeah. uh, thanks a lot, sir, for the question. Um, so, so here's how I would respond it. I responded in two ways. One is, um, I think certain disciplines, um, so reductionism is of course a natural byproduct of something like this happening, but I think it can happen 
it will happen inevitably even without multidisciplinary in the society because uh, um, you know physicists will read a book written by an economist which could be a non fiction book in fact a better way to do this is to expose the student in a course which will be relatively more systematic because otherwise the viewpoint will be very limited and i think this is uh, so this is one response that is anyway happening so why don't we do it better the second way in which i can respond it is that there are certain disciplines which are uh, unlikely to be uh, you know reduced in such a way depending on how the pedagogy and the course curriculum is so to give you an instance because for instance you are a physicist yourself you know the subprime mortgage crisis was a result of models the subprime mortgage financial crisis was a result of the models that was made by physicists because probably they never went to study rural development because they never probably had a so i think what i'm trying to argue is that an exposure and of course we have to draw a line we have to optimize it so that it doesn't become dumbing down that science in such a way that it is so you're right that of course holds uh, with respect to phd sir i think it's a burning i mean uh, you've touched the nerve i'm I, i really personally feel very frustrated and sad of how uh, we have uh, decimated the quality of phd's the not quality of phd's the quality of phd programs in india in mo in most institutions and part of the reason is uh, because we don't have home grown very high quality journals um, i think most journals where phd's are expected to publish are located in the west they have a certain theoretical framework which they follow so unless you are part of that network in which so you know if you are if you are a postdoc in colombia you have professors who are editors of that journal you will engage in this conversations in the seminars so it is high, highly likely that you'll be able to publish there over here because the faculty members themselves are not in that network and they can't be because of geography and all kinds of reasons and we have not invested in creating our own journals that match the rigor of the journals in the west and i'm not even saying that all the journals are good of course but so it's not about the point of view that these journals take it's about the rigor which they use to arrive at that point whether we disagree or agree with them or not and and unless we do that and so what has happened is phd's have become a signaling device a cosmetic tick mark device to get a job in a university because you're a phd and the faculty members in the institutions in india most indian institutions do not get additional credit for being a phd supervisor and unless that happens why will a professor want to spend hours and hours with a student in fact yeah they will probably because they'll add some publications to his or her credit because they'll probably share the name but but we have done we have done so much of harm by not investing in our phd programs very few phd programs i see in india personally which have the rigor um, rigor on either side i'm not even talking about social sciences right um, and so i think this is a burning uh, this is a sad sad bit so industry not paying phd students um, is uh, something that industry will not fix i think universities will have to fix it this is my uh, humble submission thanks thank you very much sir uh thank you very much sir and uh, most respected uh, ramchandran sir and uh, goel sir and uh, prasanna kumar sir we have had a wonderful uh, interactive session and it was very enlightening and thought provoking all of us have had a wonderful understanding of multidisciplinary and holistic education and on behalf of uh, uh, center for educational and social studies and all our co-organizers and uh, Ravaya Institute of Management Studies. We express our deep sense of gratitude to Professor Ramchandran sir for having accepted. May I request Padmavati Madam to kindly present a moment as a token of gratitude to our Honorable Chairperson Sri Ramchandran sir. Thank you very much sir for enlightening all of us. Thank you very much sir. And uh, thank you. Professor Prasanna Kumar sir for your thought provoking session and thank you professor Goel sir thank you very much sir and uh, to thank all the participants for your active interactive participation